say I'm going to use. Okay, we should move, move on. Okay, um, so I'm working with Sergei Kopaikin and uh, John Anderson, who's kind of the king of the pioneer anomaly. Um, I don't know if you guys know. Uh, and also astrometric solar system anomalies uh, is my boss. So I'm a researcher under John. Um, and I do work on NASA Juno, but also I'm analyzing Cassini data for this problem that I'm going to talk about right now. Um, so the question that we're trying to answer in our group is whether or not we can measure the Hubble constant within the solar system, which is a relatively controversial statement to make. Um, so I'm going to go through that and the logic behind that. Um, but just some background, we've seen this a little bit today, but to go over it to make sure everybody's aware, uh, you have a standard model of cosmology, which uses the Friedman metric to model cosmic expansion. That's the Friedman metric. And then to first order in the Hubble constant, the scale factor takes this form, um, where H should probably be labeled H naught. Uh, we know all this already. But the problem is that uh, at an experimental level, we use the standard parameterized post-Newtonian formalism for relativistic dynamics. Uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory uses this model. You can look at uh, some of the references that I use and uh, look at Moyer in particular. The PPN assumes far away from gravitational sources, like this one over here, where HAB is the curvature due to the gravitational source, or the metric perturbation due to the gravitational source, um, that the universe looks like flat space time. So if I go, go very, very far away, uh, it looks like the Minkowski metric. And that's what G bar is over here. Um, setting G bar to the Minkowski metric. But clearly PPN won't work as a model on scales where cosmic expansion actually matters. Usually that's assumed to be really, really, really large scales. Um, but we still want to ask that question of what scale does background expansion of the universe start to matter? Are there any observables, cosmic observables that we can see at smaller scales um, that we wouldn't necessarily expect to happen? So the usual logic for the solar system and within our galaxy is that the mass density within the galaxy or any concentration of mass will weigh down the expansion in the interior of the mass distribution. Sorry. And only space between mass distributions is expanding at really large scales. Likely reason we don't have to worry about cosmic expansion within the solar system. So standard PPN should then work fine for all solar system experiments. Uh, Sergey's work, theoretical work, basically says, okay, we know or we assume in the standard model that the universe is expanding. No matter what, we should have some sort of formalism that <coughs> extends PPN and accounts for a background metric that's expanding because we want to use some sort of formalism at any scale where background expansion matters. So um, you have the metric. Uh, be the background metric being Friedman, and then you have any sort of gravitational perturbations on top of that in the form of HIB, similar to PPN, but extending. So you see in the diagram, the background space time is now expanding with the metric perturbation in the center again. Um, and analogous to PPN, the background governs it itself. So you assume that the perturbation is small enough where it's insignificant to the dynamics of the background. And then, uh, the Einstein field equations for the full metric are solved in powers of HAB about the background metric. Ultimately, what Sergey finds in this new formalism is that massive objects, so time-like geodesics, are unaffected by background expansion to first order in the Hubble constant and 1 over c squared. So this is really important because 
it means there's consistency with the usual logic in the sense that everybody usually says that, okay, the physical trajectory of stars or anything massive in our galaxy should not be affected by the Hubble constant. So uh, this is what, Sergei, if you do the analysis in Sergei's work, this is what he finds, so that's great. But light, however, should see first order Hubble effects due to the conformally flat nature of the background metric which is really interesting because NASA and ESA uh, uses the deep space network to communicate with spacecrafts, and so that's light signals that we're sending back and forth, and maybe that's an opportunity to actually measure the Hubble constant within the solar system. Intuitively, what Sergey finds with the light time, it looks like a transformation to the expected light time uh, of that form, just add an initial term, one half h t2 squared minus t1 squared, where t2 is the time of reception and t1 is the time of emission. That's for a one-way signal. So at some point, we should see deviation away from PPN expected light time, given Sergey's framework. So we should test this within the solar system, because why not? Given that we really don't have a local, local, local measurement of the Hubble constant. If Sergey's framework actually is true. Um, so the experiments that I've been looking at in order to test this are from, uh, use the NASA Deep Space Network, and the NASA Deep Space Network is used to track spacecraft missions within the solar system. Um, we track spacecrafts uh, using a radio science communication link between uh, a DSN station and the spacecraft. It's analogous to a photon bouncing between two mirrors back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, it should be ideal conditions for testing deviations away from standard PPN expected light time because we can model the accelerations acting on the spacecraft relatively well and we can model gravitational accelerations within the solar system probably better than uh, anywhere else. Um, JPL's orbit determination software is based off of PPN and thus assumes a model for the light time of this form where R12 is just the spatial distance from the DSN station to the spacecraft divided by C and RLT are just usual relativistic terms that um, if you want, you can look at in Moyer, but you can derive yourself as well. They're due to the metric perturbations. Uh, however, the difficulty uh, in precisely modeling and looking for this light time effect is actually modeling all the non-gravitational accelerations acting on the spacecraft because this effect is likely super, super small. Any really, really small acceleration can render this test useless. Um, just for orders of magnitude uh, and oversimplifying here, uh, the Hubble modification I showed earlier in terms of a modification to the light time can kind of be thought of as a constant acceleration acting on spacecraft with order of magnitude 10 to the minus 12 kilometers per second squared. Uh, for context, that's about at the level of um, a power generator on either Cassini or uh, Pioneer emitting thermal radiation and hitting the back of the antenna on the spacecraft. So it's super, super small. Um, but that oversimplification is not actually correct because light time modifications don't actually affect the physical trajectory of the spacecraft, emphasizing that again. Um, just a little bit about radio science in the solar system so that everybody is aware. Uh, radio science consists of examining Doppler and possibly range residuals and fitting some set of parameters in order to minimize those residuals. Residuals obviously are observed minus computed values. Uh, the observed values are the properties of the reflected photon we measure. This is important because I'm going to show you some plots later. The JPL Doppler observables have a non-standard sign, which don't ask me why, but you can complain to John if you want. The um, DSN Doppler observable is actually the difference between the transmitted frequency of the photon minus the received frequency. Usually when you're doing fractional frequency, it's the other way around, um, but that's just what they use. Computed values are those computed by uh, the models that we input into the JPL orbit determination software and fitting parameters are the parameters that we're trying to solve for um, after the fact using 
JPL's filter in order to try and minimize the residual. So usually that's like the initial state of the spacecraft, um, non-gravitational force model magnitudes, like if they're thruster firings or um, if you want to estimate solar radiation pressure on the spacecraft, or if the spacecraft is orbiting like Jupiter, for example, the gravity harmonics of the body the spacecraft is orbiting. Um, JPL models also account for everything from different time scales, planetary and satellite ephemeris, forces on the spacecraft, media delays from the troposphere and ionosphere, and also any uh, plasma in between the spacecraft and Earth. We account for that too. Earth orientation parameters, so Earth rotation and variations in Earth rotation. Also DSN station locations. Um, for more, see Moyer, and I'll give the reference later. But um, we chose to look at Cassini gravitational wave experiment data in order to look for these cosmic signatures that Sergey is predicting, because um, one, it's actually some of the most sensitive data that we have to date within the solar system. Uh, you have 40 days of six to eight hour continuous tracking passes, continuous tracking passes meaning the spacecraft um, and one D instance station are sending signals back and forth, that, that mirroring that I was talking about. Uh, during all 40 days, there were no thruster firings whatsoever. And prior to um, the experiments themselves, the Cassini, well, thruster firings were used in order to orient the antenna of this Cassini spacecraft. So it was aligned consistently with the DSN station that it was locked up with, or it was pointed back towards Earth. Um, the only prominent accelerations that need to be modeled in this analysis are solar radiation pressure, which is relatively insignificant um, at this distance away from the sun. Gravitational accelerations, which is pretty standard, PPN, uh, using JPL's models, and then thermal acceleration from attached radioisotope thermoelectric power generators, RTGs. That's the effect that I was talking about previously, where um, the power, you see these booms, the booms end up, well, not for Cassini, they're on the bottom side, but the power generators that power the spacecraft end up emitting thermal radiation and impart an acceleration on the spacecraft itself. Uh, on top of that, Cassini has Doppler and range observables, which is great because it's another data set to use. Um, this is a plot of what Doppler residuals look like from Juno. Uh, this is what a good fit looks like, actually. So initially, um, you'll have the um, observable itself in the computed model. It'll be off, it'll be wrong. Uh, you feed it through the computer, and then the computer ends up saying, okay, what's the best way I can optimize the parameters that you're trying to fit for in order to minimize these residuals. Um, this is the Cassini fit that we're getting with PPN for 40 days uh, for the, one of the gravitational wave experiments. Uh, it looks good. It looks like everything is standard. There's no cosmological effects. Uh, but then when you zoom in, you actually see a diurnal pattern uh, in the residuals, which is suggesting a pretty bad fit. And we haven't been able to take out the diurnal pattern yet. Uh, diurnal misfit is pointing to mismodeling of the spacecraft trajectory. These are just a checklist of mundane parameters that you have to go through in order to make sure that you're accounting for everything, DSN station locations, media calibrations, earth orientation parameters, because a, di a diurnal pattern in the residuals is actually produced by rapid variations in Earth's spin, since the DSN station is on Earth. Why is that diurnal signature significant? Fitting method is likely overcompensating for an unmodeled term that can't be replicated entirely by a physical acceleration acting on the spacecraft. And emphasizing once more, you have to remember that the light time effects do not change the physical trajectory. So if you're assuming a certain level of accelerations uh, in the model um, that aren't actually there, 
then you're not necessarily going to get a good fit. And if, the, if you're trying to fit just uh, a physical acceleration to um, get rid of this diurnal term, uh, you're likely going to be overcompensating in some way. That's what this is saying. If I, incre if I allow the computer to um, re-estimate the RTG accelerations in the off-axis direction, so away from the antenna on the spacecraft, I end up getting uh, acceleration values that jump by 10 sigma, so uh, it suggests that there's a different issue going on. This is a little bit about the range observable, basically, because I don't have too much time left. The range observable um, is Doppler rate-aided, so it doesn't take into account any sort of a Doppler shift whatsoever. Um, in terms of cosmological sensitivities, it's just a back and forth time of flight, and we're not able to detect any sort of cosmic signature given our current sensitivities, because we only have a sensitivity at one meter. Um, and the prediction is about 0 0.3 centimeters. The Doppler observable, um, there's an opportunity here, because the Doppler observable is relying on a process of phase accumulation throughout the entire pass, where we're continuously monitoring the spacecraft, those six to eight hour passes. Um, continuous phase accumulation increases the possibility because it basically kind of compounds the magnitude of the effect uh, to the point where for a six hour pass, remember we have four, 40 days of six hour passes, uh, six to eight hour passes, you have uh, a level of the cosmic effect at 10 to the minus 12th versus Cassini gravitational wave experiments. Sensitivity is on the order of 10 to the minus 13th. Um, if this is correct and this cosmic signature is in the Doppler but not in the range, then it would make sense to fit the range not the Doppler, ignore the Doppler, use that fitted range uh, solution as your physical trajectory and then look back at any um, possible residual patterns in the ignored Doppler and see whether or not they're cosmic signatures that aren't physical. So this is what we see with uh, fitting to only the range fitting 40 days while just simply re-estimating the initial state again. You have a random distribution of residuals about zero, which is great. The slight offsets are due to a systematic of small potential pass-by-pass uh, pass pass range biases. Uh, we, we know that that's just a systematic you can't get rid of. So this is the ignored Doppler data. Keep in mind that the computer didn't even look at this, and you still have a seemingly random distribution of Doppler residuals for the 40 days about zero, uh, which is pretty impressive. But if you zoom in again, especially at the later stages, you see this linear drift. Um, and if you go back to this formula um, for the Doppler observable and what the cosmic effect should be, it should be a linear drift like h times t, basically, on a pass-by-pass -pass basis. So seeing this is pretty shocking in the sense of um, maybe something's going on here. Um, and it, it's a linear redward drift pattern evident in the Doppler residual suggests additional pass-by-pass -pass linear redshift term in the Doppler that's not present in the range. Um, and if I zoom in further, uh, you can see, well, you can go through and estimate the slope and translate that to what the Hubble constant determination would be if Sergey's model is correct. Um, and you end up getting, um, for the slope of each, about the same order of magnitude as the Hubble constant, depending on whether or not, um, I get about the order of magnitude of the Hubble constant, and I get very, very close to the Hubble constant if I ignore passes that are shorter than an hour. If I look at only the longer passes, then I'm getting way closer to the Hubble constant. Right. Yeah, sorry. Okay, one minute. Uh, so if I 
go back to the range fit and re-estimate the thermal acceleration on top of the initial state of the spacecraft. Um, I get a better estimate for the Hubble constants of each pass, if that is what is going on here. So just summary, there's a potential signature of something interesting, cosmolo maybe cosmologically and present um, in the Cassini gravitational wave experiment data, but this is ongoing work and we're being pretty conservative. Um, actively searching for a mundane explanation for what that linear drift on a pass-by-pass -pass basis could be, since nobody believes you can measure the Hubble constant within the solar system anyway. So if anybody has suggestions, let me know. Uh, another reason for hesitation is these linear drifts become far more pronounced towards the end of each of the Cassini gravitational wave experiments when compared to the beginning. And I'm not sure if this is a fitting issue with regard to the filter re-estimating the initial state as a boundary condition, or if it's suggestive that the linear term is something non-cosmological or mundane in nature. Uh, we also tried to replicate the Pioneer anomaly analysis with Cassini data, but there are ambiguities with the way JPL and, well, we ended up modifying the light time code that haven't been resolved. If I just go and manually remove a 40-day linear bluebird drift, I'm not sure if anybody remembers the Pioneer anomaly. If I remove that from the Doppler residuals and decrease the line of sight RTG, kind of like with uh, Pioneer, there is no significant, no significant difference I'm finding in fit for Cassini when I'm comparing with JPL Navigation's original standard fit. But that diurnal signature that I was showing is still present in both cases anyway. So the diurnal signature for me is a real indication that, okay, something's wrong, something weird is happening, uh, maybe something really, really interesting. And that's it. Uh, in terms of theoretically, yes, Sergey is using Friedman for the background. You, you use Friedman for background? In terms of the computer analysis? I don't know. Oh, no, 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 no. In, in terms of uh, the theory side where you're predicting terms like this term, you're using Friedman for the background. Uh, okay, then the, the, the second question. If we use um, uh, Friedman Robertson Walker method as a background, in fact, it is produced uh, by some uniform uh, method distribution. And uh, 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 if there is uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, massive body in, in, in this background, uh, this body will be, uh, uh, produce uh, perturbations actually right. in uh, this background. Right. And uh, you, you need to somehow to take this into account. Right. Did, 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 did you manage to? Yes, uh, that's exactly what Sergey does. I mean, you do that in PPN as well. It's just the background is flat in the sense of like. No, it's just that you, you, you don't need to, uh, to take into account any back reaction. Uh, because because uh, uh, the, the, if you specify there is no background matter which produces this, this uh, flat metric, you, you, you don't need to take into account back reaction. But in right. Friedman and Robertson Walker metric. You need to take into account the, the, the creation. And, uh, from my point of view, it's uh, just the uh, key problem in all such uh, treatments, uh, um, in, in all such theoretical treatments of uh, uh, local cosmological effects. Uh, how did you manage this? Um, so in Sergei's analysis, back reaction ends up being a second order Hubble effect and not a first order Hubble effect. I'm simply looking in the data for first order Hubble effects because oh, it's a small. This is a higher research. Yeah. And so finally, I would like to, uh, to make just a short comment. You know that uh, the accuracy of your spacecraft um, observations seems to be insufficient to reveal the uh, uh, 
Там была космолочка «Лотец». And in uh, this context, I would like to just mention that uh, my point of view was always that uh, it um, would be much more reasonable to look for local uh, cosmological effects, not from the dynamics of spacecraft, but uh, from uh, the, the long-term dynamics of planetary systems, because uh, Hubble effects are uh, circular effects which uh, uh, are accumulated. So, from this point of view, uh, an analysis of planetary dynamics uh, may be more so, so if you uh, just look at that term right there in terms of what I was saying with uh, massive geodesics or time-like geodesics in uh, Sergei's perturbative framework away from Friedman, uh, he shows that trajectories of massive bodies should just be essentially Newtonian and there shouldn't be any sort of effect whatsoever, which maintains consistency uh, with the usual logic that everybody says that within the galaxy, we shouldn't see any changes to the physical trajectories of massive bodies. Ah, so do, do, do you reduce all the effect just to the influence on the uh, sigma propagation? Exactly. Not on the ah, ah. Exactly. Everything, everything, exactly. everything is reduced to the signal. Signal propagation, signal. that's it. So it, it, on, the, to first order, what you find is the only effect should be on um, signal propagation, on, on light. Yeah. I just want to clarify further this uh, theoretical effect that uh, your colleague is claiming. Is this a, is he predicting a redshift in the frequency of light to occur even though there's no f expansion of the physical objects, or is he simply saying that there will be a additional time delay in the time with both. no redshift in the frequency? Both. both. Which, is, which is it? No, uh, he's assuming there's going to be an additional time delay, and all, because there's going to be more light time, and, and you're going to have a frequency shift, yes. Alessandro? Um, to make it quick, uh, yes. uh, Liza Yeah. Any chance to measure to the 10, 10 to minus 18 meter per second square per second per meter? Right. Uh, you have a problem? Not yet. I think not, unfortunately. I, I have no idea. That would be really cool. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe it's worth the thing. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Uh, right now, there are very few data sets in order to do this type of analysis. The only other data set that we have is Pioneer, um, and that's kind of a minefield, and it also doesn't have range data. The actually best data sets are the Cassini gravitational wave experiments, so that's why I've been concentrating on that. Okay, this time for the speaker.